This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 29. In today's podcast, I'm going to be talking to Joni DiPlacido from Kobo. We're talking about how you can work better with Kobo in order to sell more books. But first, to last week's question. I asked what was keeping you sane during lockdown. We had some hilarious responses to this week's question. And a thank you to Jasmine, uh, Kim, Ritu and Maddie for all calling me out for suggesting that any rebel author was sane in the first place. I take your point. It's a very good one. I apologise. Andrea Kimbop said, I wrote a list of things I want to concentrate on and had a Zoom group call with my old workmates from uh, the bar I used to work in and played cards of humanity with them. Never played it before, so it was a laugh. If there was any game that could epitomise this podcast, it would probably be Cards of Humanity. It's an outrageous card game and hilarious as long as you have a very dark sense of humour, which I do. Uh, Matt Goodall said, I'm very fortunate in that I'm in an essential industry, so I've worked throughout the lockdown. I've kept on doing what I was doing before, but burying my nose in books, both to read and write. And Amy Sand says, my sanity hasn't been affected by lockdown, as I've been practicing social distancing unknowingly for about three years or so anyway, which I also found hilarious because for any author who is a full time author, writer, freelancer, just full time self employed person, uh, a lot of us do spend all day every day on our own anyway uh, I know I did for the last year I you know I work, I work for myself in my office and it's just me and the words and the characters I make up so yeah I mean in terms of the feeling of lockdown it hadn't really changed what was different for me was the six-year-old around my feet which was well let's move on this week's question is, what wide marketing tricks do you use and like? The book recommendation this week is my book, of course, because we are now in launch month. At the end of this month, on the 29th of May, the Anatomy of Prose textbook and workbook will be going live. So if you haven't pre-ordered your copy already, why? Go and order it. And I am going to tell you a little bit more. I'm going to read you the blurb. So yes, I'm just going to read you the blurb so you know a little bit more about what the book is about. Do your sentences fail to sound the way you want? Are they lacklustre with flat characters and settings? Is your prose full of bad habits and crutches? Well, in The Anatomy of Prose, you'll discover a step-by-step -step guide to creating descriptions that sing, the key to crafting character emotions that will hook a reader, how to harness all five senses to make your stories come alive, deepening your reader's experience, tips and tricks for balancing details at the sentence level, Methods for strengthening each sentence through strategic word choice, rhythm and flow. Dozens of literary devices and how to utilise them to give your prose power. Tactics for differentiating characters in dialogue as well as making it punchy and unforgettable. A comprehensive prose-specific self-editing checklist. How to embody your character's personality at the sentence level and the most common pitfalls and mistakes to avoid. The Anatomy of Prose is a comprehensive writing guide that will help you create sensational sentences. Whether you're just starting out or are a seasoned writer, this book will power up your prose, eliminate line level distractions and help you find the perfect balance of show and tell. By the end of this book, you'll know how to strengthen your sentences to give your story, prose and characters the extra sparkle they need to capture a reader's heart. If you like dark humour, learning through examples and want to create perfect prose, then you'll love Sasha Black's guide to crafting sensational sentences. So you guys ought to go and read The Anatomy of Prose and pre-order it so you can start creating kick-ass stories too. 
and I will leave the links to both the textbook and the workbook in the show notes. In personal update news this week, uh, this week was so much better than the previous two. I really struggled the previous two weeks, but this week I got a lot more done. I woke up with a lot of fire in my belly on Monday and I was just determined to get shit done this week. So that's what I did. And I sorted out a lot of back end stuff. So linking paperbook and ebook versions, formatting my old workbooks to give a little bit more space for people to write in them. So I've got new templates and covers and I've been uploading those things and I will be, uh, yeah, just basically sorting out a lot of, you know, back matter. So updating versions of books. This is the problem. When you, when you have published a lot of books, you have to be a good publisher and go back and update, you know, back matter in all, all of those books to link out to your new books. So yes, I've been doing all of that kind of stuff. And um, I have also finished all of the bonus material. So there is a bonus download, which just has, uh, you know, the reading list and a few extra ch- uh, list type things from uh, the Anatomy of Prose. And then I've also created a, sp- a prose specific self editing checklist, uh, which you can get by signing up to my mailing list. And so going forward this next week, I will be working on a secret nonfiction project. I will also be focusing on launch and promotion. I'll be continuing to uh, work on the Anatomy of Prose course that I'm creating. And last but by no means least, I will continue uh, reading Trey, digging up uh, Trey, basically the last, the third book, sorry, not the last book, there are five. I will be digging up uh, the, oh my God, let me start again. I will be working on Trey. I've dug him up and that makes him sound like I killed him. I didn't kill him, although he nearly killed me. because the work is so hard to write. Get a grip, Sasha. Where was I? Trey is the third book in my young adult series and it's 75,000 words and it will probably cap at about 90. So I need to go back and just reread where I was, fix the beginning and nip and stitch and uh, you know sew everything together. So that book is then finished too. So I will be continuing to read through what I've written so that uh, when I finish... Uh, a couple of the things that I'm working on now, I can just dive straight into that. On the 13th of May, which will be, I think the week after this goes live, I will be going live on Meglator's uh, I Writerly YouTube channel, and we will be discussing how to better use the senses in your writing. So if you would like to join both of us on that, then you can, and I will leave a link to her YouTube channel uh, for that. So the Rebel of the Week this week is Renee Gallant Jr. Renee's son is our rebel and this is his story. Renee says, our school system has a very strict dress code. Boys' hair must be above their collar, above their eyebrows and not below the earlobe. Individuality is not encouraged in this town. My son's senior year, the principal let him go the entire year without a haircut, and I'm a beautician. I told my son, who is a drummer and a rebel always, that he would regret it. Sure enough, the week of graduation, the principal tells my son that if his past his shoulders glorious hair is not dress code compliant by graduation night, he will have the police escort him from the building. What the fuck? Did what any heavy metal, sun-loving rebel beautician would do. We layered his hair and pinned the long parts up underneath so it looked like he got a haircut. After graduation, he stood in the foyer of the auditorium and unpinned his hair. The principal was a good sport. He just shook his head and laughed and said, you got me, Brett, you got me. Oh, I love this story so much. I love that you not only rebelled, but you did it by playing a prank. For anybody that knows me in real life, my son and I like to play pranks on each other constantly. Um, 
So I absolutely love this story. I remember on my son's, I think, it, I can't remember if it was fifth or sixth birthday, I taped, I put crepe paper uh, over his door and just layered and layered and layered it until his door was completely sealed shut and he had to burst out of his bedroom door for his birthday. It was, he loved it. He, I just remember waking up with him going, Mommy, you've tricked me. <laughs> literally in that like uh tone of voice as well and uh, i dyed his milk purple or brown i can't remember anyway it looked gross uh so yes i love these rebel stories and we are getting low on rebel stories so please do send in your rebel story of the week and remember it can be any kind of rebellion big small or otherwise you can email your rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me at rebelauthorpod no new patrons this week, but two patrons, Tom Fowler and Amy Sund, both upped their pledges to the $5 tier this week, which means they have now got access to the exclusive Slack Rebel Author group. I'm thinking of running private uh, Slack sprints and other Q&As and things in there uh, for exclusive benefits to you guys. I wanted to say a huge thank you to all of my current patrons who are helping to ensure that this podcast continues. And if you would like to support the show and get access to all of the bonus essays, posts, sneak peeks, previews, blooper reels, and all of the other good stuff, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And that is Sasha with a C and not an S. On with the show. Hello and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am joined by Joni de Placido. Joni is the Author Engagement Specialist on the Kobo Writing Life team and the co-host of the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. She moved to Toronto from Edinburgh in 2013 and has been with Kobo for two years. She loves reading, talking about reading and working with indie authors every day. Hello! Hi Sasha, thank you for having me on. No, thank you so much for coming on. I know that we've obviously spoken over email lots, but I um I'm a huge fan of Kobo and so I was really, really pleased because um I really like to promote everybody being wide and I think it's really important that we um, you know, get sales all over the place in all of the different countries. So I was so thrilled that you were uh, happy to come on and talk about Kobo. So thank you. Oh, thank you. This is great. We love being able to talk about Kobo and it's great to have that a little bit of coverage in the UK as well. Good. Okay, so before we crack on with getting into uh, Kobo and how authors can make more sales on Kobo, could you tell me a little bit more about you? And uh, so first question, do you write? Second question, how did you come to, you know, work at Kobo? What is your what is your journey, your story? Okay. Um, okay, so I do not write. Uh, I would like to do more writing. Um, I used to write a lot when I was little, and I've participated in NaNoWriMo with the rest of the Kobo team here. And this year, that propelled me to do a little bit more writing. So it's something I would like to do, but at the moment, no, not a lot of writing. <laughs> more reading. Um, and how I came to work at Kobo, as you said, I moved here from Edinburgh seven years ago, and my I originally studied Italian and Spanish language and literature, so books, but in Italian and Spanish, uh, up at St. Andrews, which is in the north of Scotland. Uh, after I moved here, I was teaching English for a little bit, and then I did a certification in publishing in Toronto and did a few internships with publishing houses in the editorial department. So I was with uh, Knopf Random House, uh, Dundurham, which is a Canadian indie publisher, and I was an intern with a literary agency and then I started at Kobo on the Kobo Writing Life team and I've been with working with indie authors ever since. Ah so quite a wide I mean obviously all in the industry but quite a wide range of um, things that you've done there. Yes which has been really interesting. And because obviously you said you are a reader what what I, I have to ask what are your genres? <laughs> um, quite varied especially working here I work with so many people that have very varied reading tastes. I gravitate towards lit fiction, um, quite a lot of non-fiction. I've been reading a few rom-coms lately. Um, pretty varied. Okay, cool. So what was your favorite book of last year? Oh my god. Um, I know that's an awful question to ask. A big question. <laughs> 
What did I, um, I read The Silent Patient last year, which was a thriller, which I really, really enjoyed. I remember devouring it over one evening. Um, I don't know if I'd call it my favorite, but I really, really enjoyed it. I read a lot of good books last year. Hmm. Have you read it? I haven't. It, it's a movie, yeah. though, right? I think I may have seen... Is it the same um, I don't actually know if, if it's a movie. I haven't heard about it yet, but it's, uh, I think um, it, I feel like there was a Liam. I feel like there was a Liam ne- 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 Neeson, Neeson, Nielsen. Very Liam? possible. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. we will <laughs> sidestep our clearly bad movie knowledge. <laughs> Get back to what we do know. Um, okay, so Kobo. I think lots of writers love the principle of being wide, but obviously are worried that it's harder to make sales. So what general advice would you give an author wanting to sell their books through Kobo or, or you know, wide generally principles that, that they should follow? That's a great question. Um, I think the most important overall tip I would give is to treat every retailer as an opportunity. So every retailer is a unique opportunity and they will all have different strengths and um, their readers will be different, their customers will be different. So it's on you as an author to research how these retailers work, where the opportunities are and how you speak to the customers or the readers at that particular retailer. Um, For example, one of the things we always tell people is do your research. So say you are writing contemporary romance, go and look at the romance pages of every retailer that you're selling through. Look at how they're marketing and how they're selling books, how they're laying the page out and think about where your books will fit into what they're selling. And um, it's always worth also reaching out, particularly at Kobo. We're a very small team and we're very open to authors reaching out to us and saying, listen, this is my book. This is the idea that I have. This is how I'd like to try and sell it. How does that work in your platform? Mm-hmm. And Kobo also has lots of resources, doesn't it? So it has a blog and it also has a, a podcast. I don't know if you can direct people yeah. to where those are. <laughs> um, so um, our blog is www.kobowritinglife.com. Super easy to remember. And we link to our podcast within that blog. Um, the podcast is called the Kobo Writing Life Podcast and it's available anywhere that you are streaming your podcasts. Um, but it, it is also in the blog. Um, we have... Our main site is kobo.com slash writing life. And you can email us for specific information at writing life at kobo.com. So we're very, very available. We are, as I said before, we're a very small team. And so we see every single email and we either respond to it ourselves or we find the person that should be answering the question. So we're very approachable in that sense. Um, and that's one of the unique things about Kobo, I would say. Um, another opportunity that we have at Kobo is that we have um, we have a very easy to use dashboard and within that dashboard we have the promotions tool which I know you're very familiar with it's something that is only available right now in English language so it's not there automatically you have to email us to request it um, but we will enable it for you and that gives authors the opportunity to be featured in prime spots on Kobo.com so we have several different um, types of promotion we have um, spots that you pay for so we it, spots range from I think five dollars is the cheapest 50 Canadian is the most expensive to my knowledge and um, you pay a flat fee and your book gets featured the other option that we have is a percentage of cogs which is cost of goods sold so that way that's a great opportunity for new authors because if you're not sure that you want to put any money up front this is a very low risk way of doing it we take an extra percentage on top of what you're selling if the promo doesn't go well then you haven't lost anything amazing so let's let's look at in more detail at kobo what do you think are the common misconceptions that people have about Kobo or even the biggest mistakes that you see authors making with Kobo? Okay, um, common misconceptions, I think, particularly in the UK, I think people maybe don't know that we're based in Canada. We're not a US company and we are a very small company. So we're competing with Amazon, Google and Apple and we are the scale of Kobo is so much smaller. So that's that's something that I think is really important to know that we um, were owned by Rakuten, which is a Japanese um, tech company, but we operate quite independently and we started as a Toronto startup. 
Um, another misconception is that I, I think people don't realize how global we are. A lot of authors, particularly in North America, are quite North America centric. We sell all over the world. We have um, partnerships with retailers in every country um, that we sell in, essentially. So we have um, we are partnered with Indigo in Canada, which is a big bookstore, Walmart in the U.S., um, Fnac in France. And the reason that we've done that is we figure that retailers local retailers know their customer and they know how to sell books so instead of waltzing in as a brand new company and saying hey we're Kobo this is what we're about we're talking to people that are already selling books and saying you know your customers like let's sell through you uh, which means that we sell we actually a lot of our authors do incredibly well in places like the Netherlands which people don't expect um, US and Canada particularly Canada uh, New Zealand and Australia as well are big markets for us um, France and Italy are also growing, but I think that's one of the big ones. And this is what I love about Kobo is that um, I think, and I mean this with no disrespect to you know anybody in the writing community, but we can get very UK and USA centric and forget mm -hmm. that the rest of the world exists. And actually, you're just leaving money on the table because there are other people in other countries who want to read books, you know, and, and even books in English as well. You know, you look at um, China and there is an absolutely enormous uh, English speaking population over there, um, you know, and 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 yeah so I, I, that's one of the reasons I love Kobo because it is an opportunity to you know get into those other markets and and find readers in other countries as well um on the Netherlands you I wondered if you could talk a little bit um about the because you have a um, like a subscription model that's very similar don't you do you have a subscription model yep absolutely yeah. yep so I, I think that's that. one of the things Kobo Plus, yeah, that's it. I think people might not know about it, so I don't know if you can just talk a little bit about yeah. that. Um, Kobo Plus right now is, like you said, it's a subscription-based, all-you-can-read service that we offer right now just in the Netherlands and Belgium. And it's an option. Readers don't have to have a subscription. Um, they can also buy a la carte. But it works incredibly well, we found, um, for English-language speak English -language content, um, Turns out readers in the Netherlands are voracious readers. They're happy to read in English. Uh, the way that it works for authors is you, when you upload and publish a book to Kobo, you have a little box that you can tick to opt into Kobo Plus. It is not an exclusive opt-in. You always, always, and this is something that's really important at Kobo, we always want you to be able to sell your books wherever you want to. So no exclusivity, nothing like that. You do opt-in for three months. And that is simply because we want to give your book time to be seen and gain a little bit of traction on Kobo Plus. If you opt in and then you decide for whatever reason you need to come out, it's not the end of the world. You can email us and we can take you out. But uh, that's the commitment is three months. Most likely, it's most of our authors so far have done very little to push their sales in the Netherlands. It's something that they opt into and then readers pick up the book and sometimes they do really, really well. Okay. So that's something that... Um, that we're pretty excited to explore further. Um, the way that people are consuming content now is moving more and more towards all you can read subscription type programs. So we're excited. We're thinking about introducing it in other geos also. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something we're really excited about exploring. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a stay tuned one. Yeah, exclusive reveal on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what can writers do to sell more books on Kobo? Uh, the big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to assume that you have a beautiful cover and that your book has been edited and is ready to go. Um, in terms of selling on Kobo, one of the big things to remember, as we said earlier, is that our readers um, are mostly in Canada. So if you're using targeted ads, target Canada. Um, remember about Canada, as well as the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, all the English-speaking geos, um, and also the Netherlands. If you are, if you're looking at targeted ads, targeting um, users of Bull.com, which is the our partner in the Netherlands. Um, targeting your Kobo readers in particular also. Um, in terms of more general 
tips about Kobo. Um, make sure that your metadata is clean. So what that means is if you're putting up a series, make sure that the series is written exactly the same way for every book. If you're using a number, make sure that if it's a numeral, that it stays a numeral, because that way our system can automatically link them. If your books are linked automatically, then uh, first of all, they'll be grouped together on the Kobo store. It also means that when a reader finishes a book, they'll get an automatic prompt to buy book two. And uh, when you release a se uh, sequel, then your readers who have finished your previous book will get an email saying, hey, Sasha Black has written a sequel. Here it is. Here's the link to it. So it's really, really important. It makes the buying experience nicer for the reader, means that an author is selling more books. And that that's is really awesome. Easy. Yeah, it's an easy one to, to accidentally add a the where there wasn't one. So take a little bit of extra time to check that your series are linked. What else? Um, ask us for the promotion tool and go in and apply for promotions. That's a really, really big one for getting visibility with Kobo readers, getting those prime spots on the Kobo store. Um, there is a huge amount, as you can imagine, there's a lot of demand for promo spots. So when you apply, like rejection is an inevitable consequence of that. So if you're applying for promo spots, do it again and again and again. Yes, Let I us know. <clears throat> I can vouch for that. <laughs> I think I had to apply 16 times to get one particular spot. But hey, I applied 16 times and I got it. So, you know. <laughs> and how did the promo go? Yeah, good? excellent. I think I made three times my money back. So, yeah, I was extremely happy. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And that's um, another thing. If you have something big, if you have a book bub deal, for example, if you have a feature deal or you have a new release coming out that you want us to know about, it's always worth shooting us an email. We might not be able to do anything, but we also might. And if we can, then we will put your book in a, we, some, we have a bargain list. Um, we do have a, a new release list as well. Um, with new releases, it's also worth putting them on pre-order because that way our merchandisers can see that there's a book coming out. They can add it to the new release list. Um, also, the, yeah. um, I now understand why <laughs> the read-through is so good on Kobo because, um, so I have two in my fantasy series up at the moment and mm -hmm. I've almost finished the third one. Um, so guess what I'll be doing when that's coming out? <laughs> But um, yeah, so I when I after I did the um, promo, I was really surprised at how uh, how much higher the level of read through was on Kobo versus Amazon. But obviously, if you're email if you if you're emailing readers mm. who finish the book, inevitably, you know, a large proportion of those are probably going to take that nudge and then go and and get the second book. So that makes a lot of sense. This is why that you is need to be on Kobo. To know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what else is good. About Another thing I should mention is that um, so the way that our earnings or royalties work is that any book priced over two ninety nine is seventy percent earnings. However, we don't have a cap, um, so you can price as high as you like, which I believe that other retailers cap it at a certain amount. So the way that this works well, particularly on Kobo, is that our authors will box up their books and sell them as a box set, and then you can put a pretty high price on a box set, and our readers are quite tolerant of that and are aware that they're paying for a six book set or a trilogy or whatever it is. Um, so that's another little Kobo tip. If you have books, put them all together, bundle them. Yeah, absolutely. Or even go nuts and do, you know, if you've got a 10 book series, do your whole, whole 10 box set and you're still yep. getting 70%. That's insane. So crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and something else I should mention is our um, partnership with Overdrive. So Overdrive is um, the digital library system. And we have a great relationship with Overdrive. Um, we, you have the option, again, it's the same as Kobo Plus, it's a little tick box. You can opt into libraries, which just means that librarians will see it in their catalog. The way that it works for us is that you set a price um, a little bit higher than your retail price, two or three times as high. The library purchases however many copies they want for their catalog and uh, readers can then take it out. So you, authors get paid once for the, for the sale of the book and then the li library can continue to lend it out as though it was a traditional book yeah and um, that and that's why you price it a bit higher i'm guessing exactly yes yeah. um it's a really good answer as well i know that a lot of authors have said to us that maybe they have their first in series free they'll get emails from readers saying oh when is your next one going to be free or i love your books but i can't afford to buy them like that's the answer tell your library that you want to read my books and they will buy my books mm -hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Any other mistakes that you see writers making when, you know, trying to work with Kobo or trying to get sales on Kobo? Um, one of the big ones that we see a lot is that authors um, don't link to Kobo. So it's really important if you are trying to sell books and you're trying to adopt a wide strategy is that you're not just linking it to one retailer. Uh, a lot of authors use books to read, which is great. It gives you the universal link. Um, just posting the links to Kobo as well as the other big retailer is a really big <laughs> one. Shall and remain that's... nameless. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another big one is remembering that your book is selling elsewhere, so adjusting the prices accordingly. So if you price your book at, uh, I don't know, £2.99, then when it converts, it's going to be slightly off. The numbers are going to be, I don't know, 4 72 or whatever in a different country. So look at every single country that you're selling in and make sure that it's rounded up so it's Seven ninety nine instead of whatever it comes out as in the conversion tool. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's yeah. one that we see a lot. Like people will have two ninety nine, three ninety nine, and then in Australia it's like four fifty two, and it just sort of looks a little bit less professional. Mm. And you might as well round up and get that extra fifty cents on it. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's a psychology there anyway, because point ninety nine, regardless of whether it's five ninety nine or two ninety nine, because it's point ninety nine, you're in the lower pound bracket. And I think readers generally or, or buyers, anyway, shoppers in general feel like they're getting a bargain. Mm hmm. And that's another cool thing about being an indie author is being able to experiment with pricing. You don't need to if you Feel that a particular price point is too high and people aren't buying it you can experiment with bringing it down but you can also go the other way I think a lot of authors especially when they're new will be selling a kind of 99 cents 199 price point and we've noticed more and more pushing their prices up ever so slightly um, and still getting the sales so that's one of the great things about being independent is having the freedom to explore and see what works and change it if it's not working um, so here's a question. What mm -hmm. can writers do to help Kobo? Um, tell your readers about Kobo, I think is a big one. Like readers are going to read wherever they want and they should. Um, but I think a lot of people in, particularly in the UK, I, I noticed when I was home over Christmas um, that people maybe don't know about Kobo or they don't know how it differentiates, how the Kobo e-reader is different to a Kindle. Um, so that's a big one is just uh, sharing those links about Kobo. Um, what else can you do? I think that's really it. I'm I, Emailing us and letting us know what's going on with you is a really great, it's great for us. Um, so like I said earlier, if you see an opportunity on Kobo and you think, well, what can you do to help me? Email us. We can talk to you about it. Staying in touch with us is a really big one. Um, in terms of readers, yeah, I think I think just spreading the Kobo word. And in terms of helping us, keeping in touch with the team in Toronto, um, the team in Europe as well. If you're if you're, oh, uh, I've met Camille. Florida. You've met Camille. Oh, yeah, she was lovely. Were you in France? <laughs> no, um, a London book fair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's great, and that's something that we, I think, is really helpful in every way because it's, it's helpful for authors but it also helps us we get to hear about what our most successful authors are doing and as you probably know in the indie world people are so generous with their knowledge and people want to help each other and so having hearing from our authors what's working and what kind of new opportunities there are is really valuable for everyone do you guys um get to come over to, for the london book fair or is it usually the european team that get to go you right now it's the european team okay okay just wondering if we could at? share a gin <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would be fun um are you going to any conferences in the uk this year other than are you going to lef um, uh, yeah yeah so i always go to london book fair um last year i did the 20 books to 50k in edinburgh um oh, go to that yeah it was so good um i'm trying to think um if i'm going to, I, I would really like to go to frankfurt book fair but i don't know okay. we'll have to see october feels like a really long way away so <laughs> we'll yeah. see i would well, love to one. If, if authors are attending conferences and we're there like that's why we're there we're there because we want to talk to you so if you're at a conference and you see us like come say hi even if you're new to kobo or you're not in Kobo yet like it's fine come speak to us <laughs> that's the biggest thing <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and also I can actually um, vouch for how friendly everybody is and the fact that you really do get a personal response from a real human when you email Mm -hmm. Kobo. Because I've emailed before and said, oh, help, like I want to get more sales on this or I want to do that. And, you know, you get a really personal, lovely response from somebody who's super helpful and gives loads of tips and tricks, some of which I'm still trying to implement. (laughs) And that's the thing. And I think that that is one of, uh, we touched on it already, but I think that is one of the misconceptions is that um, because we're competing against these giants, people might not know that, that we are just a small team and that everybody on the team really, really cares about books and they really care about our authors and we want to make the best reading experience for our customers. And that's, I think that's why I really love working at Kobo because everyone cares so much. (laughs) Absolutely. Anything else you'd like to tell listeners about working with Kobo or Kobo in general or? Um, audiobooks I should have talked about already, actually. We recently launched um, a native audio system where authors can upload their own audio files with their books. So it's just as easy as uploading your ebook, works exactly the same way. Um, and we only launched that in late 2019. So it's a fairly new initiative for us. Uh, we're really excited about it. A lot of our authors have adopted it quickly and enthusiastically. So we're building a catalog of KWL audiobooks right now. Um, as a listener or a reader, um, it's also good to know that we have one app that incorporates audio and ebooks, which I like. Um, yeah. And with the audio, are there promos in the promo tab for that as well? Not yet. Great question. Um, we are right now. We're doing manual promos. So if you have a, an audiobook and you're interested in promos, um, that's when you can send an email, writinglife at kobo dot com, mm-hmm. um, and we can help you with that. It's not in the promo tool yet, but it will be. Okay. Super. Um, This is always my favourite question, but um, (laughs) this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell me about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Oh my God, I'm so unrebellious. (laughs) (laughs) Make it up, lie, it's fine. (laughs) I don't know. I was discussing this with with some of my coworkers here and I was like, you know, I'm so like, I I was a pretty boring teenager even. But we were talking a little bit about um, about rebellion with indie publishing. (laughs) And how um, how essentially independent publishing is a little bit rebellious. Like I think that's one of the most exciting things about it is the bringing down of the gatekeepers, and saying, well, you know what? Like you don't get to tell us what is what's going to sell or what's publishable. Like this is it's a really exciting time because authors are taking that into their own hands. And it's like when I say that, I don't want to say that we're competing with traditional publishing because we're not at all. Um, a lot of our authors are hybrid authors and traditional publishing is still, I think, has a very important place in the industry, but I'm really excited about what some of our authors are doing. Um, I love that. It's one of the things that we talk about a lot at Kobo is uh, so many of our most successful authors are women. So, so many. And I don't think you see that in any other industry. And I think a lot of that is because particularly with romance, I think a lot of Um, authors have maybe been told no or been turned away or maybe people don't want to read that and our authors prove the industry wrong again and again and again and I think that's pretty rebellious and pretty great so okay I I, that was a cop out it was a total (laughs) cop out (laughs) I'm sat here like how hard could I press her (laughs) Okay, well, I think moving from Edinburgh to Toronto uh, was... Is it Toronto you're in? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was quite rebellious to, you know, emigrate. You know, I'll I'll give you one. Yeah, my dad still isn't happy about it. (laughs) Seven years on, he's still unhappy that I did this. Um, Amazing. So tell listeners where they can find out... um, more about publishing with Kobo just remind everybody um you know about all of the things that Kobo does the podcast all that kind of stuff where they can find out more all right um kobowritinglife.com is our blog lots of information on there lots of stories from authors uh the Kobo Writing Life podcast you can find anywhere um Sasha Black you have a great interview on on the podcast (laughs) yes I do Uh, (laughs) yes and who else should you listen to? Uh, Michael Tamblin, Kobo CEO, did a really great interview. Uh, Lauren Lane did a great one on using Pinterest. Oh, we have so many good interviews. So check out the podcast. Um, Instagram, 
kobo.writing.life, Twitter, Kobo Writing Life. And if you are ready to set up your own account, it's kobo.com slash writing life. So we are in all the places. <laughs> and if you have any questions or anything at all, I want to get in touch with one of the team. It's writing life at kobo.com and you will reach us. Amazing. Thank you so much. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Thank you very much to all of our listeners. I'm, and thank you also to our wonderful guest today. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Joni de Placido. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Week, I'll be talking to Sarah Painter from the Worried Writer Podcast. And we are talking about self-doubt and imposter syndrome, a topic that is near and dear, unfortunately, to my own heart, because I am a big suffer, sufferer of both self-doubt and imposter syndrome. So she will be taking you through lots and lots of tips and tricks for how to combat that in order to continue to publish your books. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Oh,